So hi, good morning everybody and welcome back. So I'm Lou Woodley, I work at AAAS and I'm really interested in both the technical, so think online tools, and the human, so think people, community managers, who really make scientific collaborations, scientific teamwork, scientific communities actually function productively. So I've been invited to uh, talk here this morning about communities of practice and as Jeff has outlined, that's really because what we want to do now for the remainder of the conference is think about what comes next. You know, we've had these um, productive, useful, uh, generative conversations, um, but what now? And uh, the, the notion of a community of practice is something that, that has been kicked around for at least a couple of years, but we've never really had explicit conversations about, well, what does that mean? What does that look like? How might we actually create that and participate in it? So what I'm going to do is I'm essentially going to give you a 10-minute primer on communities of practice theory. So the notion here isn't to be top-down. It's not about saying, you know, there's a right way and a, a way that we can do this. It's to give us a framework. It's to get us back to the theory so that we're, we're thinking about this um, from the same perspective. And we can use that then as a way of opening up the dialogue about what things we might want to use and where we may decide to go forward from here. And listening to this and going, actually, we're not a community of practice at all, is a completely valid response. So there's no assumptions about the, the output here. So what I'm going to be doing is drawing on the communities of practice literature. Primarily, this is the work of Etienne Wenger and colleagues. So they've been thinking a lot about uh, knowledge generation and social learning over the years and have come up with uh, a lot of the foundational ideas about communities of practice. And this talk is going to break out into three key takeaways. And those takeaways are designed to match along with the core themes of the conference. So we have models, methods, and measures. So I'm going to start, um, first of all, talking about methods. So that's the why. Why, why do we need communities of practice ever? Um, how do we deal with knowledge generation? How do we deal with the cultivation and the, the use of knowledge? Then I'm going to move on and I'm going to outline the model for communities of practice. So communities of practice have a, a strict definition. Uh, we think about them in a particular way. So I'm going to elucidate that model uh, and drop in a few questions that might help us start thinking about what that might apply to, to us in this science outreach space. And then finally, the, the final thing is um, measures. So really getting to evaluation and, and just touching on this idea of, well, okay, if we do go down this route and we do decide that we want to do something more together, how are we going to know whether it's working or not? Okay, so um, let's start at the beginning. So let's start with uh, the methods and thinking about knowledge management. So if you think about how generative, hopefully, the, the past couple of days have been for you, and you think about the, the conversations that we've had as a result of the lightning talks, around the tables, in the corridors, at Story Collider, out on the terrace, over lunch, and you think about um, what you gain from that, Really, we've been iterating knowledge together. We've been dropping in our own experiences, the things that we've done, sharing those with others, and, and building on that together. And that really fits in with the, the five ways in which we think about knowledge. So first of all, knowledge can't be codified simply as a static object. So if we'd given you all a bit of paper or a laptop and we'd said, write down everything you know about science outreach, that wouldn't really be very useful. And if we put that all together in one place, that isn't going to make any one of us any better at doing science outreach. So we, we think about um, knowledge as not being able to be broken down into that single static thing. Part of the reason for that is that knowledge, as, as I'm sure you're well aware, can be both explicit, so the kind of things that we choose to codify in publications, in posters, in presentations, and implicit, so the kind of things that we learn through interacting with each other, through having conversations, through talking about how things are done around here. As a result, knowledge is therefore also iterative. So like the process of science itself, you know, we, we may start with a core set of, of assumptions, a core set of things that we know, but we're always building on those. We're always testing them, adding on a bit from somebody else, trying that out, coming up with um, new knowledge. And that means that knowledge, the generation of knowledge, is a social endeavor. You know, we don't sit in our dreaded silos and learn stuff by ourselves. We learn it through interacting with each other. 
And then finally, for knowledge to be maximally useful, um, we talk about how important it is for knowledge to get out of those silos and actually um, cross boundaries into other areas. So knowledge is maximally useful when we can reuse it and apply it to different situations. And so the reason that I'm outlining all of this is that communities of practice, this notion of them, this has arisen as a way of cultivating and managing knowledge together. So a community of practice comes together around doing and, and managing knowledge in, in these ways that I've just described. So to end the first section, um, some questions. So do we think we need a community of practice in terms of um, bubbling up the, the various expertise that we have in this room and, and beyond the room for the folks that, that weren't able to be here? Um, does a community of practice sound like a framework that might be helpful? And then reflecting on your own needs and your own expertise, you know, what knowledge do you have to give and in, in what format? How have you most enjoyed sharing things here? You know, maybe you ended up in conversations about things that you didn't realise you were going to talk about, and these are things that you want to take forward. And then what would you like to, to get in terms of gaining knowledge from other people? Do you know what you don't know, and do you know um, how you might go about finding it out? Okay, so the second section, as I said, we're going to talk about models. So I specifically want to outline what we mean when we talk about a community of practice. And so Wenger and colleagues describe a community of practice as having three key structural elements. So they talk about the notion of a domain, a community, and a practice. So the domain, this is really what it is we are focused on. So for a community of practice to be um, most effective, we need to know why it is that we're gathering. This really gets at the, the purpose, the goals of why we're coming together as a community. And that then gives us an, identifi an identity. So we should self-identify as being part of a community of practice, and that allows us to know why it is that we are here. That also allows people looking in from the outside, so other stakeholders who may be interested in what we're doing, to see that there's legitimacy in that. So we, we've created a, a definition of why we're doing what we're doing. And so one of the questions that I would ask about this is, is science outreach our domain? Or is that too big? Is that, is that too amorphous? Is there too much going on there? Are we actually talking about multiple sub communities of practice, focused on different areas, different types of outreach, different audiences for outreach. I don't want to presuppose what that looks like, but if we use this framework to think about this, um, how might that influence what we, we might want to create after this meeting? So the second structural element of a community of practice is the community. So we've talked a lot over the last couple of days about uh, reaching out to underserved audiences, making sure that we're including all voices in the room, um, making sure that we don't make assumptions but that we listen deeply and therefore we learn um, from, from everybody that we bring together. So once we've identified a particular domain or various subdomains, then we need to be quite intentional about saying, well, who do we need there around that table to help us advance our knowledge, to cultivate our activities in that particular domain? And then the final piece, as I hope is following on quite logically, is the practice. So that's okay, we know what domain is, we know who we've got around the table, what are we actually gonna do together? Just standing up an online site and putting a bunch of documents in there, that's not a practice. You know, we talk about cultivation of knowledge through the ways I described at the beginning, through interactions, through building something, through trying to tackle a particular problem. You know, do we want to work on a subgroup working on evaluation models and comparing what we've each done in our, our different projects. Um, do we want perhaps to, um, you know, think about writing something together? You know, there needs to be um, an activity or a set of activities which may include meetings, may include annual conferences, may include webinars, may include live chats. Um, but we need to be regularly doing something together to cultivate this core knowledge base that we have. Okay. So that was section two, so that's thinking about three structural elements of what a COP is. And then I promised the final thing that I was going to end with was touching on the, the measures theme, or thinking about the evaluation. And so one of the signs of a healthy community, as it gets set up and as it gets to maturity, is that we be, we're able to be self-reflective. We're able to kind of say, well, is this working for me? Why am I here? Are we, are we really doing things that are useful? And with a community of practice, then, um, firstly, obviously, we need to identify the shared goals for that community of practice. But it's not just about saying, well, are we producing the output, the, the report, the conversations, the thing that we said we were going to do? 
So it's not just about saying, you know, let's, let's count clicks, let's count comments, let's count, you know, what's going on there. Because we think about knowledge, as I said, as spreading out beyond silos. So if we come together, like at a conference like this, and we share knowledge, what happens to that knowledge afterwards? So what are you going to do with what you learnt here? How, how is that knowledge that, that is being created within a, a potential community of practice helping you get better at your day job or helping you tell somebody at your institute how you know, they could go and look something up or talk to this other person and learn this thing? We call that the concept of a double-knit knowledge organisation so that you're in the community of practice and we're cultivating knowledge together but then we take it out beyond the community of practice and we weave it into what we actually do in the outside world. And that creates really interesting self-reflection and evaluation questions because we don't just measure what goes on in the community of practice and the group, but we start thinking about what that looks like out in the world. Okay, so that's the end of the primer. That was Communities of Practice 101. So um, what I encourage us to do, and, and Ben's going to help us think about this, like ground this now in, in practical reality and, and what this actually looks like. Um, but just think about, you know, as a result of the conversations that you've had here, what might this Communities of Practice notion mean to you? Are we thinking about sub-projects? Some, has something occurred to you that you'd really love um, to work on and that you'd love to, to cultivate together? with other people. So thank you for listening. wondering um like how do we build a community without making it without make putting up extra barriers like when people see oh it's already a community like i can't join type mm -hmm. of thing yeah and i think there's a there's definitely a balance to be struck here so um we need to create a strong enough sense of identity that we like i say we self-identify as being part of something we feel committed to it we want to keep coming back we want to work together but we also need to think about um, you know, having a, a certain humility that maybe as we start working on these things, we realize we don't have all the voices around the table yet, and that we actually need to have pathways through which people can come and join. So these are not intended to be static entities. So for example, let me give you an example. At AAAS, we have a social media working group, meets Monday morning, 11 AM. And that transects across all the dreaded silos, so it's various editors, various pro program directors, and so on all of whom don't have enough time on their own to keep up with all the changes in social media. So they join this working group once a week, one, to share current campaigns, things that are, that are going on, so that everybody else in the organization who's online knows about it, but two, to talk about the changes. Oh, Twitter's made yet another tweak. Oh, well, Instagram now lets you do this. And so by coming together in that group, they learn about that thing in a, in a quick way once a week. That's their community of practice. But the point to your question then is, that's a flexible domain, right? People are going to leave and move on and do other jobs. New people are going to join the organization. It's totally fine that those new hires then come and integrate into that community of practice. You know, it should be visible enough that people know where the front door is and then welcoming enough that if you have a, you know, a reason to be there and something that you want to contribute, that you're able to come in and integrate with those activities. Uh, hi, Lou. I'm Kyle from Girl Science and uh, Academic Stand-Up. I wanted to touch on something, and I kind of want to bring it out to the room um, that you mentioned, and it's the reflective practice. Mm -hmm. And I feel like uh, I don't actually know how often people do it in their activities. And, and it's different yeah. from debriefs. It's completely different from debriefs and sharing um, in, in meetings, in team meetings. Um, and I'm kind of curious, like, for you who straddled the worlds of both UK um, science outreach and the US science outreach, how have you seen it? Um, and then maybe in the discussions, it'd be great to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, sort of what's nice about, about this meeting, at least for me, from, from the perspective that, that I'm viewing it from, is that we've intentionally baked in those moments of reflection. You know, in the fellowship program that I run, um, we do a week-long training week in, in January, and we cram their brains full of all the, the theory about communities. But every afternoon, we take an hour and a half to just let people think. And we create a, a basic worksheet of prompt questions that they're free to use to help or completely ignore and discard. 
But it's like, think about how this stuff applies to you and think about how what we are doing together as a group is either helping or hindering or revealing to you things that you hadn't thought about before, maybe even in the way in which you interact or, or try and work with this information. So I really think baking in reflection like this, like coming together and talking about our various different experiences is, is just a way of, of giving us that pause to sort of inhale, exhale, and then re-engage. I mean, it, again, it's a, it's a structural thing in terms of how we create it. It may be, I've seen it done in various different ways. I've seen some communities have a Monday work out loud session, for example. It's totally open-ended, it's online. If you want, you can come in there and use it as an accountability thing, as, a, as an open reflection thing where you say, this is what I'm worried about or working on or doing this week. That's a, a simple structural way of doing reflection. The way we do it with our worksheets at our, our fellows week, that's more structured and more elongated because we specifically want them to figure out how to apply the, the learnings back in their home organizations. We could do this on a larger scale by coming together once a year and having reflection baked into what we are doing as part of that meeting. So it looks like different things in different places. Uh, Stu Ravnick, UT Southwestern, and I, I apologize if this question is overly naive. Um, what is the relationship between a potential group like this with the already existing group of NABI? Um, and I'm not trying to be odd about it, it's just is it useful to have something completely separate or is it useful to actually integrate more strongly or have a sub-working group? Yeah, and I think, I think those are completely valid questions. And I would say that NABI is not the only organization that is thinking about communities of practice in this space, right? There are, there are multiple ones. AAAS convenes one um, as well. Um, I think part of this is being quite realistic about what it is that we as individuals want to achieve, right? That we, we are all very busy people. We cannot be fully present in multiple different places at the same time. So it's really about finding, finding your tribe, finding your people to do the thing that you want to work on. And I, I personally don't necessarily think that it matters who the convening organization is, and I don't necessarily think those convening organizations have to be in competition with each other, and I'm sure they wouldn't describe themselves as such. So I think they can be interrelated, but we should also be realistic about not expecting people to be as engaged in every location, although have visibility on what is going on in the different spaces. Hey, thank you.